to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The pride of your heart has deceived you. Obadiah, verse 3. We welcome you today to our study of the Minor Prophets. Today, we're thinking about the little-known one-chapter book of Obadiah. And so we want to encourage you, if you don't have your Bible out, to get it handy. Take just a minute to find the book of Obadiah, the fourth prophet in the Minor Prophets, and we'll study that together today. It's an exciting message, and it's a practical message from God's Word. And so we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. We're excited about looking at the Word of God together with you. And as always, we want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the churches of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area, they'd love for you to stop by and visit with them. For the worship on Sunday, whether that be at morning or maybe Sunday evening or Wednesday night Bible study, they would love for you to visit them. You would be an honored guest at any of their services. In fact, you'll find people there who love God, who love others, who are deeply concerned about what the Bible says and who more than anything want to help men and women to know God and to go to heaven. And so if you'd like to study the Bible, if you've got a Bible question, you want to hear more about the good news of Jesus Christ, there'll be people there who'd be happy to sit down and open up the Bible and discuss the Word of God with you. We'd also like to help you here at the Gospel of Christ in your desire to know God and His will better. Check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all of our topical lesson. We have lessons on every book of the Old Testament and the New Testament, over 500 different lessons. They're all available free of charge. Have transcripts, written material, study guides, just a good host of Bible study material, all available to you free. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We can send you a download of that instantaneously, or if you need that in another, another format, we can make that available to you as well. And friend, we want to encourage you to check out our Facebook page, as well as the Gospel of Christ app that is available both for Android and iPhones. It's a great way to keep up with what we're doing and study the Word of God in our fast-paced world today. And so once again, we're excited you've joined us, and we hope you've got your Bible out and open to the book of Obadiah. Let me give you just a little bit of the rich history of Obadiah that will help us to understand what's going on in this book a little better. Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament and probably one of the least known books of all the books in the Old Testament. The historical background of Obadiah takes us back to a very memorable struggle in Genesis 25, a struggle between two twin boys. Jacob and Esau and their constant struggle for their parents' approval throughout their life. You see, the Edomites are descendants of Esau. And like Esau, who sold his birthright for a bowl of beans, the Edomites are about as fickle and shallow as the patriarch Esau. They are willing to sell out Israel and God's people so that they can keep their safety and security. But little did they know, God was the real source of their safety and security. You see, the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, they felt cheated by Jacob, and they held that continual grudge against Israel since he sold out the birthright. And so Esau, Esau later grieved for that birthright with tears, but he couldn't take it back once he sold it. 
When he sold it, he sold it. It was his decision to make. He didn't really have anybody to blame for, for, but himself, but that was a big loss to all of his descendants, and they felt cheated because of that. And so as a result, they hold this grudge against Israel. They refuse in the book of Obadiah and throughout their history, uh, they refuse to allow Israel to pass through their land during the time of the wilderness wanderings. Read about it in Numbers 20, verses 18 through 21, and they won't let Israel pass through because of that grudge. They at times actually tried to take advantage of the Israelites. Uh, in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 22, we're told that they tried to invade Judah and take some of that back, but they ultimately failed. In fact, they even joined the Babylonians in the siege and capture of, capture of Judah, and they even cheered the enemies on. Psalm 137, verse 7, and Amos chapter 1, verse 11 tells us, and so they are definitely antagonist to Israel, God's people. And ultimately, we learn from Obadiah 10 and 11 that they rejoiced over the downfall of Jerusalem and God's people. And so here are some kind of key ideas to help us understand Obadiah. The key word is going to be that of calamity. You cannot rejoice at the calamity of others and not expect calamity to come to your doorstep. It just doesn't work that way. Key verse, verse number 10 of Obadiah, we hear these words said, for violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. Their violence, their wrongdoing caught up with them. There's a key phrase to the book. It occurs in verses 12 through 14. God says, you should not have. And so that key message is Edom is going to be destroyed because they rejoiced at the calamity of their own brethren. You know, the practical application of the book of Obadiah is this. It illustrates man's inhumanity to man. When we look at and rejoice at other people's downfall, people that we don't like, people that aren't like us, people that talk different, look different, act different, dress different, but are still made in the image of God. When we look at and rejoice at people's destruction, friend, that's a dark day in humanity. And so the application is we should never, ever be happy at anyone's calamity or destruction. We ought to want all men everywhere to know God and to be saved and to enjoy the rich blessings of being a Christian. And so let's talk about today some of the practical and living messages straight out of the book of Obadiah. The first living message that we see is that our pride is one of the chief causes of calamity. Look at Obadiah verse 3. I want you to hear what God says to the Edomites. The pride of your heart has deceived you. Well, what do you mean, God? You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, you who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? And so geographically, the king's highway would come right through the area of Edom. And on both sides, there were high cliffs. And the Edomites lived in these cliffs and they thought because of their location, not only could they ambush if they needed, but they thought because they dwelled in these cliffs, nobody would ever come up there and get them. And God said, I'm going to come up there and get you. You're, the pride of your heart has deceived you. Your calamity is at hand. Friend, when we get to thinking that we are, we've done it all ourselves, we're big, we're bad, nobody can touch us, we've got everything worked out, we're our own God and we can save ourselves, would you remember Proverbs 16, verse 18 with me? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. In a nation that was founded on one nation under God, if we begin to remove that and we begin to put our trust in our might and our power, in our military weapons, in our intellect, in our wealth, in our whatever it may be, or, or whatever ideas you might like to put in that, we begin to trust in those things and push God into the back. Friend, the pride of our heart 
is definitely going to have the best of us. Our calamity is always impending. When God is not in the center, in first place, where he needs to be in our life. And this was so true of the Edomites. They were so angry and so grudgeful toward their own brethren, their own kinsmen, that they actually rejoiced at their safety and their destruction. Can't you imagine them up in the cliffs laughing as they're destroyed by Babylon? What do you think God thought about that? Man's inhumanity to man is always on display. When we see other people who are different than us, when we see people of, of different nationality, different skin color, different financial background, whatever it may be, and we wish them ill because of that, or that causes us not to love them like we ought to, they were no different than the Edomites who wanted their own people's destruction. And so what do we learn? Not only is pride one of the chief causes of man's calamity, but learn this as well. We cannot, man, no matter how high or how low he goes, cannot hide from God. Look at Obadiah verse 4. Look at what God says to these people. Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. As we mentioned, these Edomites often dwelled in those high cliffs. They were familiar with them, and most people weren't, and they made their homes in it and thought they were safe because of that. And God says, you may be right up there with the eagles. You may nest with the high birds. Don't think I can't get up there and bring you down. Friend, when we, when we think that our, our safety, our blessings, our security, and our well-being is tied up in things that we do, and we think security systems, we think great military background, we think all these other money and wealth, and all that's going to take care of us in the day of calamity. If you don't have God, and you don't love, if you don't love God, and you don't love others as yourself, that day of calamity is not very far off from any of us. You see, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, up in that cleft, down in that valley. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. All things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. Psalm, uh, Hebrews 4, verse 13, Proverbs 15, verse 3. And so when we think about these ideas, let's realize I, I can't hide from God. You can't hide from God. Instead of trying to hide from God, let's put God back on the throne in our lives and do what he wants and live as he would have us to live. As we think about the idea of Obadiah, there's some questions we've got to ask ourselves today. Are we sometimes prideful in our location? That, that's how the uh, Edomites were. They, they dwelt in these cliffs and the cleft of the rock where nobody could get. God got to them. We live in the greatest country in the world, we say to ourselves. We have more freedom than anybody else. We have a, a, a powerful military force. Do we put our trust in our location? 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, if we do, we need to take heed, lest we fall. If God's not the source of where our safety is, we're not safe. Do we put our pride in our wealth? A little bit more of the history of the Edomites. Not only did they dwell along the king's highway, but the two cliffs of those cliffs of those rocks that they dwelt in made it such that it was a tight corridor, and anybody who passed through those cliffs of the rock they charged them a toll. And so they were making a lot of money off of that road that came through their area as well. It was like a modern day toll road, you might think. But what about us? Do we put our pride in our wealth? some of the wealthiest people in the world, best homes, best cars, best jobs? We all have a lot of stuff. Pantries are usually full. Is that where we put our safety? Friend, if it is, we're in for a big surprise. Safety is not going to be found in our wealth. Some of the wealthiest cultures in the world weren't safe when they didn't have God first. Are we prideful in our allies and our friends? They made allies of the Babylonians. They made allies of the other nations around them. They would even use them against Israel. But when the day of reckoning came, God tore every one of them out of the clefts of those rocks. If we think that our allies 
that the world nations, the, that all of that's going to protect us, that's not where our safety's at. That's not going to save us in the day of calamity. Oh, we're prideful in our wisdom. They thought they were some of the wisest people to live because of what they had done, where they were. Wisdom won't save us. The wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. We need to put our trust in God and His truth and His way and treat others with the kind of respect that they deserve to be treated. Are we prideful sometimes in our own strength? Look at Obadiah verse 9. You know, sometimes we think because we're strong and we've got a lot of vim and vigor, we can still do these things. Look at what God says. Then your mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountain of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. You know, if there's a common thread throughout the Bible, it's that God is not concerned about the show of force. God can do with a few what others it might take many to do. The, the weak God can use for his purposes. Think about, if you don't believe that, think about the story of David and Goliath. Little shepherd boy, couldn't even wear the armor, couldn't even pick up the sword, defeated one of the greatest military giants ever. God doesn't save with show of force like we do, and sometimes we put that in our strength. God is our refuge and strength. He's our very present help in time of trouble. But then there's another lesson that the book of Obadiah teaches us to be passive in other people's destruction is also wrong. Look at what they were doing. I want you to look in Obadiah verses 10 through 12. It wasn't just their active wrong, but they were also passive in it. For violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. Now watch what they did. In the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that strangers carried captive his forces, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. But you should not have gazed on the day of your brother in the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Jerusalem. It wasn't necessarily like they were out there with the sword and they were out there actively doing anything, but they watched it happen. They knew it was coming. They rejoiced when it happened and they didn't do anything to stop it, to help or to prepare a, a Israel as well. You know, sometimes we say to ourselves, well, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't, it, it wasn't my fault. I didn't do that. Well, could we have done something to help? Could we have done something to stop it? Romans 1 verse 30 teaches, not only those who do those things are wrong, but those who approve of the evil things mentioned are just as bad. And so you can be passive in somebody else's destruction as well. We need to be the type who are helping and ready to do what's right. And then, of course, Obadiah teaches us that we must not rejoice over other people's destruction or take advantage of other people's destruction. Look in Obadiah verses 13 and 14. God says, and this is such a powerful statement, you should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads to cut off those among them who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of distress. They rejoiced at it they took advantage of. When the enemy came in, they were ready to swoop in and take some of the spoils they left. When people tried to escape down that road, they cut them off. When they came looking for them, they said they went that way. Go get them. They rejoiced over and they took advantage of other people's destruction. Friend, it ought to break our hearts when people turn from God. It ought to break our hearts when other people face calamity and difficulty and casualty in their life. To not just watch it happen, but to rejoice over it and use it. You know, I think of things like when a storm comes in or a hurricane or some tornado comes to an area, some of the first people to crawl out from under the rocks are the looters. They want to go in and steal stuff and get stuff and take advantage of other people. That's a sad statement on humanity. Instead of doing that, we ought to be looking for opportunities to help and to do good, 
and uh, lift a finger to help people rather than to take from them. And so I think we can kind of see the shallow, fickle nature of Esau in his descendants. You remember what happened, don't you, with Jacob and Esau? Esau, unlike Jacob, Jacob was a man of the field. Esau was a hunter. And Esau was not the best at it that day, I guess we'd say. He'd not had a good run with his hunting luck lately. And so he's pretty hungry. And Jacob cooks uh, lentils or beans, a bowl of beans. Now, my grandmother used to cook a good bowl of beans. You'd really, you'd about give something for that, but not hardly. Jacob cooked those bowl of beans, that bowl of soup. And Esau must have been so hungry, maybe he was starved. Jacob said, I'll give you a bowl, but you got to sell me your birthright. And in the moment, based on impulse, because of his fickle and shallow nature, he sold it out. Later, he regretted it with tears. And ever since then, his people have been selling things out. They sold out God's people. They sold out themselves. And they didn't even realize it as they rejoiced over the calamity and the demise and destruction of God's people. Well, what's another powerful lesson we learn from the book of Obadiah? It's this, the principle of reaping what you're sowing is clearly seen in this book as well. Look at Obadiah verse 15 with me. God says, for the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. Listen now, as you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal, your repayment shall return upon your own head. As you drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. Here was their final and ultimate destruction from Almighty God. And, and, and again, the principle of reaping and sowing is clearly seen in this picture. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. And let's see, this is not just a principle for the Edomites, it's not just a principle for what they did. This is a principle that the Lord taught us as well. Look in Galatians chapter 6. I want you to look in verses 6 through 10. The Bible says, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What do you mean? For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. When that when those Edomites, their pride filled their heart and they thought nobody could touch them. When, when, they, when they helped, when they laughed, when they looted Israel, when they drank out of that cup on the mountain of Israel, Mount Zion, I wonder how they felt when the first prick of the sword from their enemies touched them. I wonder how they felt when God pulled them out of the cleft of the rocks. Wonder how they felt. Wonder if they thought we're reaping what we sowed. Friend, if, if we're going to learn from the book of Obadiah, not only do, do we learn to do good to all men, to love God and to love others, but we also learn, don't think you're higher than God. Don't think you can get away with things that God has not allowed. There's a lot of people who live this life in sin and immorality, and sometimes we trick ourselves into thinking, God doesn't know about this sin. God, I face all these things, and it's okay if I do this. God knows. Friend, you're fooling yourself. Your day of calamity is coming. You can't reap and not sow. Sometimes we think about it this way. I believe it's old gospel preacher Johnny Ramsey who said, sometimes we sow sin and we pray for a crop failure. Not the way it works. 
If I sow wickedness, I sow inhumanity, I sow injustice, if I am not kind to other people, if, if I rejoice at people's downfall, please understand, there's a day of calamity coming. That day may not be till the judgment day, but each one of us is going to give an account of that. Now, friend, there's a way that we can avoid that, though. There's a way that we can be prepared for that day, a way that we can be sure that we're right with God is by obeying the gospel and living as a Christian. Friend, if you're not a child of God, we encourage you today to become one. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? The Bible teaches in John 8, 24, unless you believe that I'm he, you'll surely die in your sins. Are you willing to turn from a life of sin and wickedness and ungodliness and turn to God in repentance? Acts 3 verse 19 says we repent and turn that our sins might be blotted out. Would you do like the Ethiopian eunuch and make the good confession? I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts 8 verse 36 and 37. And to have every sin washed away, would you do what the Lord said? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. So if you're not a Christian, we urge you today to put the Lord Jesus Christ on baptism. Love God, love others, do everything you can in this life. As Galatians 6, 10 says, do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. And for those of us who are Christians, you know, sometimes we get upset at sin. Sometimes we see enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we think about how God ought to bring his judgment down on those people. Friend, if God chooses to do that, that's his will. We need to want those people to be saved and turn to Lord Jesus and never rejoice at their calamity. And so we hope you'll join us next time as we study more from the Minor Prophets. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand, and downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the Gospel of Christ.